Good afternoon. When I was seven years old, and my sister was just five, we were, we were playing on top of my bunk bed. And uh, it was my G.I. Joes against my sister's My Little Ponies. And at one point, my sister got really excited, and she leaned backwards, and all of a sudden, she fell off the bed and crashed onto the floor, landing painfully on her hands and knees. Now, I've been charged by my parents to make sure that my sister and I played quietly and safely, for they were just settling down for a long winter's nap. And I saw this cry of pain and injustice welling up in my sister and about to erupt. And I did the only thing my little frantic seven-year-old brain could think to do. I said, Amy, Amy, wait. Did you see how you landed? No human lands like that. You... You're a unicorn. <laughs> now, I must be a Picasso because I peaked and this is a seven-year-old. <laughs> I cheated because I knew that there was nothing my sister wanted more than for the world to realize that she was, in fact, a unicorn. And you could see on her face, her brain struggling conflicted between devoting resources to feeling the pain and suffering and injustice she had just experienced and contemplating her newfound identity as a unicorn. <laughs> and the latter won out. And my sister had a smile come across her face and she, clam she climbed back up onto the bunk bed with all the grace of a baby unicorn. <laughs> now what my sister and I had stumbled upon at the age of seven and five was something that was at the vanguard of a scientific revolution two decades later. We're learning that the brain is a single processor and it has to devote its resources to only certain parts and certain things at a time. As a result, our brains get to choose between the wail of injustice and suffering or choosing to view the world through the eyes and mindset of a unicorn. In this case, mindset and happiness are a choice, a conscious choice that are improved and made easier by training and training which has been researched over the past two decades to find absolutely extraordinary ideas. And we're finding that our mindset and the way that we surround ourselves with experiences absolutely shapes the experience of happiness and our pursuit of potential. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here because that's exactly what you've chosen to do. By signing up for the UP experience, you've decided to reject the, the previous notions, the previous patterns of the world in order to transform yourself through the renewing of your mind. And for me, it's such an, it's such an honor to be a small part of that today. And an, and an honor to be back here in Texas. I'm from Waco, Texas originally. I grew up my whole life in Waco for 18 years until I, one of my friends dared me to apply to Harvard, and I did, and to the, my shock and to everyone else's shock. When I got in, I, I have not left yet, because I'm afraid if I do, they won't let me back in. <laughs> so I... Uh, I I've, I've been at Harvard and see, seen extraordinary things over the past 12 years that I've been there and loved every minute of it. But when my friends come up from Texas, up from Waco, to come see, to see uh, Harvard, they oftentimes say uh, that it's a little bit like visiting uh, Harry at Hogwarts from Harry Potter. This is the freshman dining hall at Harvard. This is where all the freshmen get to eat their meals. This is Hogwarts. <laughs> The only thing missing are the owls. And when my, when my friends see this dining hall and they see all these amazing resources and all the opportunities facing these students, they say, Sean, why would you study happiness at Harvard? It seems like Harvard is a different type of population and what could a Harvard student possibly have to be unhappy about? Now, for the past 12 years, I've lived and researched and taught at Harvard and I still find it to be a magical place. But even as J.K. Rowling pointed out to us, the existence of magic does not preclude the existence of suffering. In a Harvard Crimson poll, 80% of Harvard students, 80% experience work debilitating depression at some point during their four years at Harvard. Four out of the five experience depression while they're there. Now this is due to base on the expectations that are placed upon them both on the inside and out. And this is true for students all across the nation. But imagine for a moment, if you will, students who ever since, some of them, ever since they were in their crib and they were put into little Harvard onesies and maybe a little Yale hat in case something terrible happened. 
And ever since they were in special pre-pre-pre-K school, they were at the top 1% of their class of being able to point out the primary colors. And then they were the top 1% all the way through high school, and then they walk into this freshman dining hall, they walk in, and suddenly, to their horror, 50% of them are now below average. 99% of them will not graduate in the top 1%. And as a result, there's an identity shift that must occur. And these people struggle with it. And they, I mean, they're feeling pressure on the inside and from the outside. I know one student whose parents, uh, ever since he was little, would take uh, the placemats he would draw on at Denny's or his handwriting exercise and keep them because these will be in a museum someday. <laughs> that was a lot of pressure on me. That was a lot. <laughs> Now these students are, are brilliant. They are. Every day I'm blown away by them. But when it comes to happiness, they're quite dumb. They're dumb because one of the things that we realize about happiness, I'd, actually, I'd say they're not dumb, they're just uneducated. One of the things we've started to realize in, in positive psychology research is that how important relationships and social bonds are to our happiness. We all know that. Those are the things that provide us the most joy. But when you look at these Harvard students, and one of the largest experiments that's ever been done at Harvard, I found that the average number of romantic relationships that they experienced during their four years of college is less than one. The average number of sexual partners during this period is between 0 and 0.5. I don't even know what 0.5 sexual partners is. Now, I'm not making fun of them. I'm still single. <laughs> And I'm still dragging these numbers down, but it's amazing <laughs> that these absolutely brilliant students, 24% of them, are unaware if they are currently involved in a romantic relationship. <laughs> in the midst of all this depression and lack of social bonds and perhaps the lack of love, again, I ask the question, why study happiness at Harvard? In 2006, Dr. Tal Ben Shahar came up to me and asked me if I'd be the head teaching fellow for a class called Positive Psychology. We designed this together and worked on it, and we thought that there might be 100 students designed that would de decide to take a hit on their transcript, to not take advanced economic theory, but rather to take a class on happiness. When we walked into the classroom on the very first day, nearly 1,000 students sat waiting for us. One out of seven Harvard students was waiting for us, and they were waiting because they were hungry. They were hungry because they wanted to focus upon a happiness that was not off in the future, but in the present. They were starving because despite all these external advantages we just described, they still felt unfulfilled. Now, if you've already guessed, this is not only the story of Harvard, but a story of the world in the 21st century. Depression rates in the United States are 10 times higher now than they were during the Great Depression. Malcolm Gladwell mentioned earlier how we've been pushing kids to a younger and younger age to be productive, and boy, they certainly are. We're finding that the beginning mean age of depression is 14 and a half years old, as opposed to the measly 29 and a half from 1960. Depression rates are increasing. We're experiencing what scientists are calling a progress paradox. A progress paradox is despite all our advances, the inventions of iPhones and iPods and medical technology and advances in education, we're becoming less happy. We're becoming more depressed. We've evolved as humans to become stronger and taller and smarter and more productive, but not happier. Why? Why? 